What does a house wear? A dress. Today, I'm going to recap a 2012 Western action film called Django Unchained. A quick warning, there will be major spoilers ahead. The movie begins in Texas, where in a group of shackled enslaved black people walks on foot in the middle of the Texas desert, while the brothers Ace and Dickie spec drive them. It was two years before the Civil War in 1858. Unfortunately, Django was part of the enslaved black people who separated from his wife, Broomhilda von Shaft, after getting sold off. Then later at night, their voyage suddenly gets interrupted by Dr. King Schultz, a German dentist turned bounty hunter who stumbles around in the dark to approach them. Because of that, Ace is eventually enraged as he asks Schultz to state his business or else he will get winged. So Schultz immediately responds trying to calm Ace by saying that he's simply a fellow weary traveler looking for a pair of slave traders that go by the name of the Speck Brothers. Technically, Schultz is seeking to buy Django for his knowledge of the three outlaw brittle brothers, so he assumes that the Speck Brothers have purchased those men at the Greenville auction where Django can be found. Schultz then begins with a question asking the enslaved black people if there is anyone who was formerly a resident of the Karakin plantation, so that way, he can buy Django. After Django speaks, Schultz brings his kerosene lamp to light up the faces of the enslaved black people and find Django. Afterward, he asked Django if he has any information about the Brittle brothers, so Django states their names, Big John Ellis and Roger, who sometimes they call Little Raj. Django then proceeds on talking about them, saying that they were overseers at the Karakin plantation owned by his previous owner. But Schultz stops him, telling Django that they are not the overseers anymore. He then asks if Django will recognize the Brittle brothers if he ever sees them again. However, Ace suddenly interrupts them and warns Schultz to stop talking to Django like that. So Schultz tries chilling him down, saying that he's a simple owner trying to conduct a transaction. But then, Ace refuses to sell Django and eventually levels his gun at him after Schultz rejects his order. Schultz even mocks Ace by asking if he gets carried away with his dramatic gesture or purposely points his weapon at him with cruel intention. Leaving him no choice, Schultz suddenly shoots Ace's head and Dickie's horse after receiving a threat to Ace. Because of that, Dickie pins himself to the ground as the dead horse puts its weight on his body. Afterward, Schultz walks toward Dickie's area, sarcastically apologizing for putting a bullet into his beast. However, Schultz didn't want him to do anything rash before Dickie had his moment to come to his senses. Despite seeing how frustrated Dickie is, Schultz still maintains himself to be calm and favors him to keep his cater rolling down to a minimum because he still wants to finish his line of inquiry with Django. Schultz then goes back to Django's position to continue their conversation, insisting Dickie on paying a fair price after hearing that Django can still recognize the Brittle brothers. Unfortunately, Schultz leaves the other enslaved black people to let them kill Dickie themselves while Django takes Ace's coat and horse. The following day, Django and Schultz arrive at Daughtry, Texas, unconsciously getting the attention of the house owners because Django is the first black man they see riding a horse. Fortunately, they suddenly own the bar restaurant as the innkeeper runs away, after seeing Django entering with Schultz. Afterward, Schultz shares his plan of practicing a new profession. A bounty hunter who deals in corpses after a slave trade deals in human lives for cash. Technically, being a bounty hunter is the job of transporting the dead bodies of enslaved people to the authorities after killing them, so that he would receive a bounty afterward. Even though Schultz despises slavery, he tells Django that he needs his help as he will going to make their slavery malarkey work to his benefit. Unfortunately, Schultz feels guilty, so he agrees with Django, which Django will kill the Brittle brothers and receives his freedom with $75 as payment. Later, Schultz and Django begin their voyage, when suddenly Schultz finds out that Django is a married man, after hearing his answers that he will find his wife and buy her freedom. Afterward, Django reveals that Broomhilda was raised by a German and later learns to speak German a little. Broomhilda is served to be a house slave of the von Schafts. After their conversation, they proceed to the Tennessee place and find themselves a shelter as they plan to access the plantation, which Django will play as a valley character to put up an act. 
Schultz then gives Django the freedom to choose whatever costume he wants. Afterward, they go to the plantation to visit Spencer, Big Daddy Bennett, and purchase one of his enslavers. Fortunately, Big Daddy agrees, so Schultz takes it as an opportunity to order his slave to torn Django on his magnificent plantation. Suddenly, while Bettina is touring around Django at the plantation, Django asks her if he knows about the Brittle Brothers. Yet, Bettina answers no, so Django that there's a possibility that they are using a different name. Luckily, Bettina points out the Schaffers who came to Big Daddy's plantation in the past years. Without Bettina knowing, she tells the lead of the three brothers inside, whereas the first one, Ellis Brittle, is in the field. At the same time, Bettina points out that the two Brittles are at the stable, punishing little Jody for breaking eggs. So Django immediately goes to see the two Brittle brothers and orders Bettina to get Schultz on the place. Upon whipping the little Jody, Django suddenly kills John and continuously beats Little Raj after attacking him back. Afterward, he shoots Little Raj five times when Schultz eventually arrives at the stable to ask Django the name of the two brittles he killed. Then, Django says that Ellis is hightailing across the field right now, allowing Schultz to snipe him without hesitation. Later at night, Big Daddy attempts to attack Django and Schultz with a posse, despite letting them leave after killing the brittle brothers, due to the warrant earlier in the afternoon. Unfortunately, they fail to convince Big Daddy about the penalty for taking deadly force against an officer of the court in the performance of his duty will be hung by the neck until they're dead. Leaving him no choice, Schultz ambushes the posse with explosives by tricking them using his cart. Fortunately, Schultz gets bullseye after hitting the carriage and then gives the sniper to Django to snipe Big Daddy. Afterward, Django and Schultz spend their night eating, as Django eventually topics about his wife. So, Schultz happily tells the story of Brumhilda he knows, and entertains Django. Feeling responsible for Django, Schultz tells him that he can't let Django go to Greenville in good conscience for saving Brumhilda. So, Schultz opens up about the bounty hunting business that Django might like so that he can buy his wife freedom. Django hears about Schultz's offer, wherein Django will work with him through the winter, until the snow melts, then Django will receive a third of Schultz's bounties afterward. Technically, Schultz agrees to help Django, saying that he will get Django to Greenville himself and find where the Germans sent his wife. The following day, Django and Schultz return to Texas and begin their first mission, wherein Django rifles Smitty Bacall and keeps his handbill as a memento. Because of that, Django receives his first bounty and eventually practices himself shooting using the snowman. Afterward, Django and Schultz spend their winter racking up several rewards before spring, killing many suspects without any struggle. Later, they travel to Mississippi, only to see many enslaved black people on the street. Afterward, they eventually learn that Broomhilda's new owner is Calvin J. Candy, who owns the fourth biggest cotton plantation in Mississippi Candyland. Desperate, Schultz asks how they will get her from Calvin, so Schultz offers an alternative action plan. Instead of buying a horse, they will plan to buy a farm. Schultz then suggests that Django will be an expert on Mandingo fighting he hired, because his character will be a big money buyer from Dusseldorf in Greenville and buy his way into the Mandingo fight game. Technically, Calvin is a kind of owner that forced his slaves to wrestle to the death in brutal Mandingo fights. After a while, Django and Schultz meet Calvin at his gentleman's club, finishing watching the Mandingo fights while Django refuses to see it. Afterward, Schultz follows Calvin as he talks to his champion Fred, attempting to offer $12,000 for one of his best fighters as a pretext for acquiring Broomhilda for a nominal sum since Calvin doesn't want to sell her. Luckily, they get the attention of Calvin and even receive an invitation to Candyland. The following day, Schultz excuses himself to Calvin and talks with Django, saying Broomhilda's at Candyland, so he better not get carried away with his retribution if he wants to see his wife. Technically, they are taking their route to the place when they suddenly encounter Calvin's slave trackers who have cornered D.R. Tagnan, an escaping Mandingo fighter using their canine dogs. D.R. Tagnan then pleads with Calvin, saying he can't fight anymore, but he only orders D.R. Tagnan to go down and talk to him properly. Unfortunately, 
Calvin discovers that he loses his last fight and eventually embarrasses him by asking if he doesn't know what reimbursement means. Frustrated, Schultz attempts to save D'Artagnan by saying that he will reimburse him, yet Django intervenes and prevents Schultz from blowing their cover. Afterward, Calvin stops and approaches Django, asking if he won't mind handling D'Artagnan, and that is ordering the tracker dogs to maul D'Artagnan to death. Upset, Schultz has left no choice but to watch over D'Artagnan getting eaten by the dogs. Afterward, they continue their arrival on Candyland, as if nothing happened in the woods. Suddenly, Stephen gets shocked after seeing Django riding a horse with Schultz, so Calvin clarifies that Django is a freeman and orders him to treat them well. After Schultz favors Calvin to clean up Hildy, Broomhild is named because he wants to meet her. Unfortunately, Django hears about their mistreatment of Brumhilda, so he almost takes out his gun when he realizes that he needs to call herself to buy his wife. To his dismay, Django watches the crying Brumhilda, taking her out at the litter box to clean up. Then, later at night, Lara Lee delivers Brumhilda to Schultz's room to talk. Afterward, he reminds Brumhilda that he will only speak German, assuming that Calvin's slavers listen to them because he will finally reveal their plan to rescue her. Then he proceeds on securing his offer to buy her as his escort, while he negotiates the initial deal during dinner. Confused, Broomhilda asks about his friend's identity, so Django eventually shows himself to her. Later at dinner night, Schultz begins entertaining Calvin to accept his deal when suddenly, Stephen, a staunchly loyal and suspicious headhouse slave of Calvin, realizes that Broomhilda knows Django after seeing her gets shocked by Lara Lee's comments towards him. So, Stephen makes bait by alerting Calvin that he doesn't want to buy Mandingo but Broomhilda, making Schultz and Django deduce their plan as he chooses to get Broomhilda as a trap. Luckily, Lara Lee saves Broomhilda from Calvin and Stephen's mockery, unconsciously helping Django to control himself too. Because of that, Calvin favors everyone in the dining area to leave, as he will talk with Django, his lawyer, and Schultz. Afterward, he reveals their plan of buying Broomhilda, so he orders Stephen to bring her out while physically hurting her neck. Unfortunately, Calvin alters the deal at gunpoint to sell Broomhilda for $12,000 instead of the fighter, Eskimo Joe. However, Schultz reluctantly agrees, but when Calvin aggressively threatens them to beat Broomhilda using a hammer, if ever Schultz refuses to take the deal. Leaving him no choice, Schultz gives him the money immediately. Afterward, they finish their deal as they wait for Calvin to provide him with Broomhilda's paper. However, Schultz suddenly had enough of Calvin's arrogance after hearing him say to shake hands with him, or else he will continue killing Broomhilda, shooting Calvin until he dies. So, Butch Pooch immediately responds killing Schultz using his rifle, as Django eventually goes on a rampage, shooting back Pooch, Calvin's lawyer, and several of Calvin's henchmen. Django then engages in a gunfight, but surrenders after seeing Broomhilda getting taken by Stephen and Calvin's henchman Billy Crash as their hostage. The following day, the vertically chained Django gets tortured by Billy, almost castrating him when suddenly Stephen arrives, saying that Lara Lee wants to see him. Fortunately, Lara Lee changes her mind about snipping Django, as she will give him to the Lequent Dicky people instead. Technically, Lara Lee has left no choice but to replace his brother and take charge of the plantation. She also chooses to let Django suffer to death by selling him to the said mining company. Minutes later, Django is en route to the company of his new owner when suddenly he devises an escape plan by attempting to talk with his escort, handling his first handbill to prove that he's a bounty hunter. Desperate, Django feeds them lies by giving false claims that the men on his handbill are at Candyland, then promises his escorts that he will share the reward money with them. Luckily, Django gets released by his escorts after they believe in him with the help of his co-enslaved men. Then after his guards give the rifles and dynamite to him, Django eventually kills them and returns to Candyland with dynamite in his hands. Django immediately gets into the place with a horse and quickly kills the trackers on their base first, then proceeds to the barn to recover Broomhilda's freedom papers from Schultz's corpse. The movie ends with Django then bidding goodbye to Schultz by tapping his head, planning to avenge him and D'Artagnan, who died from the mauls of Calvin's slave dogs. Afterward, 
Django directly goes to the shelter where Broomhilda is getting jailed. Fortunately, Django takes it an opportunity to save Broomhilda while Calvin's mortars return from his burial to give respect. Then, later at night, Django kills Lara, Crash, and the remaining henchmen who just got back from the mansion after mourning Calvin's death. Afterward, Django orders the two remaining enslaved women to bid their goodbyes to Lara Lee, while Stephen, on the other hand, stops him from getting outside. Upon earning his revenge, Django kneecaps Stephen as he ignites the dynamite that he already planted all around the mansions, ignoring Stephen's cries inside. Afterward, Django and Broomhilda watch from a distance the exploding manor and ride off the horse together. Because of that, people will be calling Django the fastest gun in the South from now on. If you enjoyed this video, don't be shy to hit the like button, and if you disliked it, hit the dislike button twice, just to be sure. You should watch the whole movie. Thank you very much for watching. Please subscribe for more video like this.